As the 1920s raced towards its climactic and ironic end, a new generation of flagship ocean liners was in order. Ambitious, beautiful, and prideful, these ships were destined to represent the height of the ocean liner era. Their builders and owners, of course, could not have known that with any certainty, but they did know that their ships would be the fastest, largest, and most luxurious their respective fleets had ever seen. Beyond that, the ship's speed, as well as their being powered by oil rather than the cumbersome coal of yesteryear, meant that two-ship weekly service across the Atlantic was finally feasible. Three-ship weekly services had always been theoretically possible and sought after, but proved to be extraordinarily difficult to maintain. Cunard's entry into the new generation of ships would be the RMS Queen Mary. This magnificent ship, undoubtedly the most successful of her contemporaries, is the subject of this video. The keel of Queen Mary was laid down in Clydebank, Scotland by the renowned shipbuilder John Brown and Company in December 1930. At 1,019 feet in overall length, she was supposed to be the first ocean liner in history to surpass 1,000 feet in length. She would have to cede this accolade, though, to her French contemporary, Normandy. The Great Depression forced construction on the Queen Mary to be paused, and the Normandy overtook her in the construction process. Ships of this scale were usually supported in some way by their respective governments. The cost of building them was simply too great for a single company to easily afford. Cunard's ship, referred to as Hull 534, was no exception. But beyond the sheer cost of shipbuilding at this scale, Cunard was not at its peak financially. In 1932, for example, the company posted a massive operating loss of $20 million. While the partially completed ship sat idly by, Parliament debated whether or not to provide the funds necessary to continue construction. Ultimately, the government agreed, on the basis that ships of state were unparalleled symbols of national prestige and pride, and had the potential for great utility in the event of a war. Cunard's new ship was ready for launch in September 1934, two and a half years behind schedule. Meanwhile, the ship's future rival, Normandy, was mere months away from her maiden voyage. September 26, 1934 was a cold and rainy day on the Clyde. The King and Queen arrived. Queen Mary herself would christen the ship in her honor. This was a first in modern British history. It was also the first time the public knew the name of their given ship, Queen Mary. Given the recent merger of Cunard and White Star, there was a question as to which company's naming convention would apply to the new ship, White Star having named all of their modern ships with the suffix IC and Cunard with the suffix IA. The compromise was that neither would apply. Queen Mary it was. Her Majesty cut the ribbon which released the bottle of champagne, which subsequently smashed against the ship's bow. Apparently unsure of the protocol, the world heard her through the microphone when she asked under her breath, shall I press the button now? This small gaffe was overshadowed by the ship's triumphant entrance into the Clyde, despite a small fire ignited on the ways by the massive friction. Before long, this great ship would be the largest in the world, and the pride of Britain. While Queen Mary was being fitted out, Normandy entered service and sailed on her maiden voyage in May 1935. Normandy was a marvel. Modern, radical, efficient, and beautiful. Her massive, sweeping public rooms were beyond anything else the Atlantic had seen before. Queen Mary, on the other hand, was more or less traditional both inside and out. She had some unique features such as the design of her forward superstructure, but ultimately her claim to fame was her size and speed, which she ultimately delivered on. In fact, Queen Mary was so traditional for a new ship that she actually stood out for it. Many people even likened her to a scaled-up version of Cunard's 1914-built Aquitania. The public would have to wait until 1936, though, to confirm whether or not they preferred the modernity of ships like Normandy or Queen Mary's adherence to tradition. Queen Mary remained at the fitting out basin for a year and a half. During this time, Cunard sent a spy to Normandy for a little corporate espionage, which included a voyage aboard the French superliner. It was confirmed that Normandy was undoubtedly splendid and performed superbly as an ocean-going ship. As the maiden voyage of Queen Mary approached, the John Brown Company and Cunard hosted a series of gala dinners for celebrities and other VIPs. The restaurant was modified to resemble the subject of celebration the RMS Queen Mary. Looking back on this era of Cunard's history, it is easy to get the sense that the mood of the storied company was nervous. A lot was riding on the success of their incoming ship, and her competition was a year ahead of them in terms of service time, but decades ahead in terms of style. 
Admittedly though, I could be reading too much into this. By the time the ship was finally complete, she was the largest ship in the world, narrowly beating her soon-to-be rival, Normandy. In his book, The Sway of the Grand Saloon, A Social History of the North Atlantic, John Malcolm Brennan fires off a series of incredible statistics about the scale of Queen Mary. In a world in which Royal Caribbean's Oasis-class ships are a thing, we've become numb to such statistics and hard to believe comparisons. But for a moment, put yourself in the shoes of a person in 1936 who may never have even seen a ship larger than 15,000 tons, or maybe not any ship at all. And imagine that I told you that the cables in Queen Mary were estimated to run 4,000 miles long far greater than the transatlantic route she was intended for. Or that Cunard's first ship, Britannia, launched fewer than a hundred years ago, could have fit inside the main dining room and foyer of the newest ship, Queen Mary, and still have enough room to squeeze in the fleet of Christopher Columbus's famous 1492 voyage. Or that the tonnage of Queen Mary exceeded that of the entire Spanish Armada by 22,000. Queen Mary's long-awaited voyage began on May 27, 1936. There's one thing I want to mention before diving into the ship's interiors, and that is related to the class system on board. This was a time of social change on the Atlantic, and Queen Mary furthered that change. While first class, second class, and third class had been the standard for some time, this arrangement was becoming increasingly uncommon. Normandy, for all her modernity, was actually as close to the traditional class divide as you could find on a new ship. While German ships were largely using a four-class system, Normandy stuck to the three-class system and essentially changed the name of second class to the more dignified tourist class. Queen Mary, though, maybe in an effort to prove she wasn't too far behind the times, brought a new arrangement into the mix. The renaming of first class to instead be called cabin class. The elimination of second class and its negative connotations, itself to be replaced by tourist class. Finally, third class retained its name, but continued its steady improvement in quality. All of these different systems did make for some confusion, especially since, by this time, cabin class did not mean what it used to, as all passengers were berthed in cabins, as opposed to in the distant past where private cabins were reserved for the select few. But this allowed companies to differentiate themselves in an increasingly less divided world. Without further ado, I will let Kip for Fox of the Facebook group Fox Star Line take you through the interior of this great ship. Kip for Fox of Fox Starline here, let's dive right in. The Queen Mary's interiors were greatly influenced by the Art Deco movement in the 1920s and 30s. Art Deco was the latest style at the time and was mostly inspired by the Bohas movement which was started in Germany. Although the Queen Mary had the latest Art Deco style, she also had Art Nouveau style from the previous era with her fine hardwood throughout the ship. Many modern materials were also used aboard the ship, such as marble, metal, enamel, and linoleum. The Queen Mary was designed to carry a whopping 2,139 passengers throughout first, second, and third class. The Queen Mary had a total of 12 decks. Let's start the tour in the cabin class. At the time, first class was called cabin class and occupied the central portion of the ship. These cabins were designed in the shape of an L to make the best use of width of the ship. Cabin class cabins had their own bathrooms inside. Doors connecting one cabin to another could be unlocked turning the cabin into a suite. Cabin class cabins on other decks were more of a square shape and most had a sitting room to go along with it. Cabin class was spread out over eight decks. The cabin class library was located between the first and second funnels on the promenade deck. It had the dimensions of 44 feet long and 20 feet wide. The bookcases were made up by multiple alcoves which had sliding glass panels that could disappear into the upper sections of the bookshelves when raised. There was plenty of space for tables and chairs so passengers could read and write, and the bookcases could hold over 1,700 books. The library had a quiet ambience which was perfect for reading. The cabin class main lounge was located on the promenade deck and was considered the social hub for cabin class aboard the Queen Mary. The lounge would be open in the morning and then closed in the evening. Concerts, films, and dancing was held here for passengers. The lounge extends up through three tween decks, which made the height over the central portion of the salon over 30 feet high. On Sundays, a church service was held in the lounge and all classes could attend. This was the only time that all classes could mingle among each other. 
The lounge could also be used as a ballroom with parquet flooring which covered the length of the room with oak panel design. All the metalwork had a rich gold finish and the mantelpieces with gold and onyx. A total of 32 windows overlooked the promenade deck with each window being 13 feet high and 2 feet and 6 inches wide. Situated at the aftermost part of the promenade deck was the cabin class smoking room. The cabin class smoking room was designed to appeal for both sexes, rather than like in the 1910s and 20s, only being catered to the male. The room was lit up by the light from large windows on both sides of the room. It was decorated with modern paintings on the bulkhead and multicolored furniture made up of leather that blended both traditional and modern style in the most sophisticated way. Perhaps most importantly, the smoke room had a small cocktail bar on the starboard side. The Queen Mary's cabin class dining room could accommodate over 800 passengers at one time, which was the entire complement of cabin class. The dining room was about 143 feet in length, which includes two private dining rooms at the forward end. These two dining rooms were separated from the rest of the dining room by sliding panels that could be moved to add to the dining room when not reserved. A large dome sat over the main portion of the room, 27 feet from the floor. The space beyond the main portion of the dining room is broken down by structural features to form semi-private sections. A beautiful painting by Mr. Philip Conrad with the conception of the English country life is the main point of interest in this room. A 24 by 15 feet decorative map by Mr. McDonald Gill representing the North Atlantic Ocean with depictions of England and America on the sides is displayed here. The cabin class pool was located on C and D decks. The pool occupied two decks of space with a balcony on the upper portion that wrapped around to the staircase which descended on the pool base level. The pool itself measures 35 feet in length and 22 feet in width with the deep end of the pooling being 8 feet deep. 18 dressing boxes were located on the aft end and included showers and toilets. The pool had two diving boards, which were removed right before her main voyage due to safety hazards. The Turkish baths were stationed nearby on the balcony level. Now let's move on to tourist class, formerly known as second class. Tourist class passengers would board the ship on the tourist class entry hall on sea deck towards the stern of the ship. The foyer extended the width of the ship and was decorated with fine leather chairs. The walls were paneled with Pacific maple and Nigerian mahogany, which went well with the silver bronze moldings, handrails, and life doors. The tourist class was located in the stern section of the ship and was spread over five decks. These decks were A through E. State rooms were decorated with many painted and fabric furnishings. Around 60% of the tourist class cabins also had private bathrooms. The tourist class dining room, located on sea deck, occupied the width of the ship around 112 feet wide and 78 feet long. The tourist class pool was located near the rear of the ship on F deck and was considered to be better than the cabin class pool on the Queen Mary's future running mate, the RMS Queen Elizabeth. The plunge itself was 33 feet by 21 feet, which was only a little smaller than the cabin class pool, located on the port side were the dressing rooms, 10 for men and 12 for the ladies, each having its own cold shower. Finally, we'll visit third class. Third class cabins were located in the bow of the ship or very close to the propellers. These day rooms were usually two to four berths and furnished with mahogany bedsteads of a simple design. In fact, the whole decor of the third class rooms were simple in nature. Down into the bowels of the ship, the Queen Mary had four primary boiler rooms. They each had six yarrow boilers and an auxiliary boiler room with three scotch boilers to generate electricity, two turbo boiler rooms, two engine rooms, and a feed water softening plant which produced up to 300 tons of softened water every day. On June 1st, 1936, Queen Mary was greeted in New York for the first time with plenty of pomp and circumstance. The ship was swarmed by small boats as she paraded up the Hudson to her designated pier where she was met with even more fanfare. The public was allowed to board the ship for the price of one dollar which went towards charity. But some of these sightseers took more than their donation was worth in the form of souvenirs from the ship. At the time of her maiden voyage, Normandy was officially the fastest ship in the world having earned the blue ribbon in June of the prior year, 1935. Queen Mary would soon prove to be the faster ship though, and she captured the blue ribbon from Normandy at the end of August that very same year, 
with an average westbound speed of 30.14 knots and an average eastbound speed of 30.63 knots. The story would not end there because Normandy took back the Blue Ribbon, becoming the first ship to break the four-day Atlantic crossing. Queen Mary, though, took back the fabled prize in August of 38, and Normandy never did have a chance to fight back, as she was taken under the wing of the United States government at the start of World War II in 1939, and met an unfortunate end. Do I think Normandy would have taken the Blue Ribbon again? No, probably not. But ocean liner history is filled with facts far more difficult to believe, so you never know. Queen Mary was officially the fastest ship in the world, in addition to being the largest and one of the newest. So it almost goes without saying that she was immensely popular on the transatlantic route. But even if she wasn't popular, she represented a large share of the capacity sailing between the UK and New York. Just two years earlier, Cunard and White Star merged into a single company named Cunard White Star in an attempt to preserve the heritage of each. The details of this merger are a story for another video, but it did result in the retirement of many old White Star ships, eight to be exact, all of which were replaced solely by the Queen Mary. The Great Depression and diminished passenger traffic overall had taken its toll on shipping lines all around the world, and Cunard White Star was no exception. It was the reason Queen Mary had taken so long to build and it was the reason that she was the only new build until the second Mauritania in 1939. But there was yet another threat looming over Queen Mary, Zeppelins. The Graf Zeppelin had proved that transoceanic air travel was possible when it arrived in New York on its maiden Atlantic crossing in 1928. Zeppelins as they existed had very limited carrying capacity because despite their voluminous size, a lot of lighter than air gas was needed to lift heavy objects off the ground. But the Zeppelins were fast, twice as fast to be exact, as even the Queen Mary and Normandy, the fastest express liners in the world. Zeppelins posed a very real, but limited threat to ocean liners. Shipping companies would have to keep their eyes on the situation, but for now, the impact was limited by the fact that Zeppelins could only carry about 50 passengers at a time. As the rivalry between Queen Mary and Normandy continued on, a running mate for Queen Mary was in the works. This new ship would give Cunard a competitive advantage over the French line. For the first time ever, a weekly service across the Atlantic was feasible with just two ships. The elusive three-ship weekly transatlantic service had proven difficult to achieve and harder still to maintain. In 1914, Cunard was so tantalizingly close to achieving it with Lusitania, Mauritania, and the new Aquitania. But before this great trio could settle into a rhythm, World War I killed it abruptly. It must have been extraordinarily frustrating for Cunard's leadership. A two-ship service, it could be assumed, would be easier to manage with fewer opportunities for snags in the system. And Cunard finally had that with Queen Mary and Queen Elizabeth. Launched in 1938, this new ship looked very much like Queen Mary at first glance. But contrary to popular belief, the ships were not sisters. They were in fact very different ships with a similar exterior aesthetic which fooled many. Perhaps the simplest proof of this is that Queen Elizabeth's maximum speed was drastically lower than that of her running mate, only about 28 knots. Still, it was fast enough to maintain a two-ship service. If you've seen my video on the conversion of ocean liners from coal to oil, you'll know that it was not only speed, but also quicker turnaround times in port which allowed this two-ship weekly service to exist. Queen Elizabeth, after all, was not much faster than the old Greyhound, Lusitania, and Mauritania. Although she was launched in 1938, Queen Elizabeth's maiden commercial voyage would not take place for another eight years. No, it did not take eight years to fit out the new ship. Rather, history stood in the way. Before Cunard could get its two-ship service, World War II commenced in 1939. And this seems like a good place to end part one of Queen Mary's ship story. Part two will be coming soon, so stay tuned. Fox Starline is a group on Facebook that has over 6,000 members with a common interest of sharing pictures, videos, and experiences of ocean liners. We strive to provide a safe outlet from the world for others who share our common interests of ocean liner history. Founded by myself and my fiance Sarah, we set out on a mission to set ourselves apart from the rest of the community by not allowing just ocean liners, but other ships such as battleships, airships, and cruise ships, etc. We hope that you will join us today. Keep calm and sail on.